Hello and welcome to the Shaping Design Podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Bernstein, and today we had Elliot Miskoff on the pod. We talked about iconography, getting started in design, portfolio stuff, and his Twitter fame. And this is a very special episode because this is episode 40, which means we are concluding our first season of Shaping Design. And that's just amazing to me that we were able to get to 40 episodes. Uh, It's been a wild ride so far. Lots of total fame. We're super famous. Can't walk down the street anymore. But we do want to recoup and kind of plan the next seasons that come pod and what we want to do with the podcast and the Shaping Design brand. So stay tuned to seeing more of that. The newsletter will still go out. We're going to be working and doubling down on the newsletter. So stick around. Please enjoy this episode and remember to like and subscribe to podcasts on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Substack, or wherever you listen to my wonderful words and our guests' wonderful stories. Now, Ilya Miskov. But right. uh, yeah, welcome. Welcome to the pod. Appreciate it. Nice to see you. Nice, nice to, to meet see you guys. as well. Uh, why don't we That's start off too. by having you, you know, talk about first who you are, what you do, where you work, and then we'll jump in with a bunch of questions. So for listeners who don't know who you are. All right. So um, my name is Ilya. I am a small designer from Estonia. That's a northern European country. Uh, I've been designing my whole life. I primarily do user interface and interaction design these days. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Didn't didn't you get a job recently? Yeah, the new job is at WAP, which is like a a very cool platform for digital products. And uh, yeah, I've been recently hired as a full-time designer on user interfaces. Nice. Well, congratulations. Very. And you were recently working on portfolio stuff, sharing that on Twitter, got a lot of notoriety on that stuff. Um, I'm looking at your top tweet, which isn't even your most viewed tweet. Uh, it has 238,000 views and it's a simple picture of your portfolio. Yep. And I was kind of wondering, my first question to you, kind of like, why do you think that that resonated so well online? Something that's very clear and simple and rudimentary for portfolios uh, as, as far as portfolios go. Why do you think that resonated so well online? I think that people in general, just whenever I post design stuff, people are so drawn to like clean aesthetics and anything that like has to do with like websites and UI design in general. So whenever I post something, some, you know, some little piece of my portfolio, whenever I do that, people just seem to be like crazy about it. And I quite like that, to be honest, but it, yeah. It's, it's yeah. nothing special in my opinion, but like it's it's nice to see that people do like this kind of stuff. Well, you you posted the other day something. I'm trying to scroll and find it, and I was just doing. I was scrolling and looking. I was basically stalking you before because did my research last night, did my research today, and you tweeted something that had 2.3 million views, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Twitter like. I guess kind of ad revenue stuff. Not that we're going to go into numbers per se, but um, it's about the the LinkedIn thing. We said, how do we get here? And then there's a link that I'll put this in the show notes too. It says like you know, product designer, full time, entry level, but then it's like eight years of experience. Right. Yeah. And that hit 2.6 million. And I wanted to know why when I tweet stuff like that, it doesn't hit. But when you tweet stuff like that, it hits hard. <laughs> yeah, that's another interesting question. Uh, I think it's purely because of the algorithm. I don't know how it works and why it's always like trying to promote my tweets. But uh, yeah, I've also noticed that for some reason, like the same tweets that people, that all other people tweet, for some reason, they go well for me. Uh, sometimes not, but uh, more often than not, they, they do. <laughs> Which is my my thinking behind it. I don't know, Logan, if you have any thoughts on this. My thinking behind it is that one of the weights that controls the algorithm is a specific type of person that's following you or something. 
when they like it, retweet it, reply to it, for some reason that is an amplifier. So like, for example, as soon as uh, Yorn from Framer started following and, and, you know, we interacted online, my like following count, my like views like skyrocketed into like tens of thousands uh, on a good day. And I think that he was one of those key like indicators to the algorithm that like kind of established, okay, this is a credible, kind of like how Google ranking works or something. I don't know. What I do know is I'm really bad at it. So I would love to know, and Logan, feel free to jump in with questions at any time. I want to know specifically if you would be able to break down what do you think makes some of your design related tweets hit and what would people do to like, I guess, frame their tweets more I, uh, in a way to a wider audience. So like, like again, I'm, I'm being very honest here. I do not, like I'm very new to this myself and more often than not, I, I feel like it just happens randomly. And like you said, maybe there is someone behind it. Maybe there are some influencers or like very popular people starting to like interact and like that tweet, which also like brings it up in the algorithm. Maybe it's the case, but uh, I do not have, I do not have a recipe for, you know, getting uh, high engagement numbers. I'm still trying to figure <laughs> this out myself, but like if I were to give like a proper tip, just like with any social media, you just gotta stay, the light turn off, uh, turn off, sorry. Um, you gotta stay consistent. That's like the number one rule. If you stop posting for like a week, you will you will see the hit, like a huge hit in your engagement number um, amount. So just staying at it and you know, just trying to like, not necessarily uh, cause some, you know, hatred because that's very easy to do. Like with politics, if you start posting stuff like that, you'll easily get views and engagement. Um, I don't like that kind of stuff. You just post stuff that you feel is cool and that you think people will like and Maybe they will. Uh, look, I feel like, yeah, yeah, algorithms taking such a like negative turn lately. Like you said, I mean, there's so many people that just get like Twitter famous. What a gross word, but like Twitter famous off of just shit posting all day. I feel like any of the like I won't even call them viral because they're not like crazy viral, but any of the tweets I've had that have done well have just been like the dumbest stuff that has like a slight negative connotation to it. It's like very rarely actual work I've done. Like sometimes that stuff pops off, but in comparison, like nowhere close. The engagement of like this shit post stuff just completely like gets outside of the design bubble and you can just see it like take off from there. And that's like, it's cool. But then at the end of the day, like um, that's the stuff that does well. <laughs> yeah. And that's true. And like, I've, I'm also a victim of this or like, Rather, I'm in the same boat as those people. Sometimes I, I do feel like I, I'm posting some crazy, like, irrelevant stuff, which isn't good. Like, the more I do this, the more I feel like this, this is not what I'm supposed to do. And I'm start, sort of reverting back to my original self, posting what I always felt was cool and what I always liked myself. So, um, yeah, I will definitely not try to pursue that, you know, yeah, like yeah, the engagement numbers don't bring up, like they don't give you that much in terms of like financial value. Like, if you know already, the the amount you earn per like a million views is not that much. So I wouldn't just mm -hmm. I wouldn't just uh, post shit like shit posts and stuff like that. I I just wouldn't do this, considering the the amount that you're getting at the end. Have you made any revenue on Twitter? Yeah, so I've had three payouts so far, and I'm I was being open about it. Actually, I posted this three times. So each time I got a revenue, I posted it. Uh, first one was like one and a half thousand dollars, um, one point five k. That's for like six months of posting. So it, I think it counted from February of this year up until August or July. So that was six months worth of. Uh, posting on Twitter or X. Um, 
and then the other two were about like 450 or something and then the last one was 300 and something so and yeah and so, and so the, the accumulation of the big one was because of the, the backfill from whenever yeah. elon said that he was going to start it and they didn't start it and then he okay cool um well that's awesome good for you that makes me feel a little bit better if not like it's like really hard to make money off of it because I know people do that. Some people, like, I think you also have like the subscribe thing where you can like pay to see your tweets or something. Um, I I followed you because I thought you were really, really good at iconography. Like, thank you. You have a really good eye for iconography icon, right? And I want to know more about specifically your process behind how you create icons and what your thoughts are between metaphor and more realistic, like straightforward objects uh, and what you choose to then decide for what the icon becomes. So do you like want to walk through your process of like these icon sets that you're creating and, and why, first of all, why are you creating all these icons? Yeah, sure. Um, first, I just enjoy it. It's the pure craft of, you know, using vectors. Um, in any program, be, be Figma or Photoshop or like Illustrator, whatever you use. Um, I just enjoy it. And uh, it's not necessarily the thing that you have to do, but like I do this. Um, one reason is because I feel like a lot of products these days are using things like Fund Awesome and which is like a great product. Um, a great thing to use if, if you just want to like have a full library of icons and quickly you know swap them and and resize them and stuff like that the problem is those icons are rarely you know fit to that pixel grid and so whenever you are seeing those icons on like low resolution screens or non retina screens you are, you can see sometimes those blurry lines and blurry parts of the of the icon which i absolutely hate um I'm quite a perfectionist, so I'm trying to always, you know, make those icons lie on a pixel grid, no matter what. So I usually like do hand drawn icons for each size. So it could be 16 pixels by 16 pixels, or like 20 by 20, 24 by 24. I'll I'll do those each separately, just to ensure that they are not getting blurred. Um, in regards to how I, um, like design a metaphor like do i follow them uh, sort of a metaphor for a real object or not always depends on the icon so some real world objects like envelopes for like a male icon um are relevant some icons like you know the floppy disk or yeah the floppy drive mm -hmm. are getting sort of irrelevant and you know younger people are not getting that icon anymore because they they have never seen the actual floppy in their life. And that's where I feel like we as designers need to sort of step up and start coming up with something like new, some new metaphors for that. Well, or recently yeah. I heard uh, somebody mentioned that like, so people use like the telephone uh, as a an analogy for like calling. Yeah. Um, but like they'll use the, the like corded or like, I guess cordless, but like the shape of the corded phone that we all would have seen growing up. And they're like, give it five years. And this is going to be the next floppy disk icon. Yeah. People, like the next generation isn't going to know what that is because they, they grew up without home phones and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. And like, this is happening more often. Like there are so many objects that are getting obsolete and tech is, is evolving and icon packs and like the, particular icons need to evolve as well, if you like. Well, when, when we say evolve, the metaphor itself is something that's become identifiable and then just becomes like a separate entity from the actual thing in a sense, because like, I can't imagine anyone actually that I know writes letters and then mails it across the country. I do for my grandparents and whatever, and you know, that kind of stuff. But you know, like you said before, people are not going to know what a phone from like a, like a rotary phone where you, you know, roll it, whatever, and then you hold it to your thing and then you put it back on the, on the wall. People don't really know that anymore because they don't have those anymore. So what happens to these icons? Because the play icon, fast forward, rewind, rewind, those are very old icons. 
but they lasted from technology that we don't really use. We use the idea, like the the sense of them, like moving forward in time, backwards, stopping and starting. But you know, they're now something separate from what they were if they were to mean anything back then. So like, should we update like the mail and the phone icon because they're not only universally understood for the most part because they've been trained we've been trained to know, but they kind of don't have a thing after that, right? Yeah. So, yeah, like, it, again, always depends on on the metaphor and the particular icon. Some do really need to evolve, I feel like, because um, it's just not, I just feel like it's not very relevant to use, like, a floppy disk as a save icon, for example, like, again. Uh, we are all we're all used to that because it's been in software for so many years, and like we don't have another uh, great example, of a save icon for now. But like, we need to come up with something. So, so for that one, that's based on the storage yeah. uh, medium or, or device, right? So hard uh, hard drive, floppy disk, uh, SSD, whatever it might be next, cloud storage. But why even have the icon anymore if then you just change the perception of like how to, or the entire paradigm of how you actually save? Because like an Apple, you know, they don't really use the save icon, right? They have a completely different UX where it's like, that's like the afterthought, you click command S to save it, or if you're leaving it, it's the, oops, sorry, do you want to save this or not? So like, I guess in some cases we could, hopefully get rid of the whole notion of these like save things for a better way. But then there's still things like, you know, you might want to activate a save function. I had to design something like this and, and IBM's time. Unfortunately, the, oh, Nick, yeah. that's where it's, that's where I can catch you right there. Yeah. The next question I was going to ask is how many, how many apps do you guys or like any products do you guys use uh, that even have a save? function anymore i feel like everything we use now is like if you do command s uh, and like any design tools writing you, tools you don't even is, need to it usually hits you with a tool tip like hey we auto save yeah exactly you don't even need to in figma and any other web-based tool i think it's i think there's a new paradigm for web experiences that wasn't native or wasn't like the thing for native uh experiences um because there was just such a different paradigm that they implemented in the beginning but because it's web, there's an expectation that's like, oh yeah, it's already saved. Like I type something, it's already there. Like it's permanently there until I change it again. So I, I, I like that, but there are some cases it, that you probably do need to have a, a save function manually implemented, but that just a lot of- It coincides with like everything being multiplayer now too. Mm -hmm. I feel like there was that step of like, like when Figma, when I first played around with Figma in like 2017-ish, I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. I feel like I'm like I'm playing an online game with friends and that was awesome. And nowadays it's like any tool that comes out, if I know that multiple people are using it, I'm like, oh yeah, we should both be able to be doing this at the same time in the same file. Uh, and I feel like the like the asynchronicity of it uh, is, is kind of what is also helped perpetuate not having save states anymore because it's just expected. It's like if I do something in an app, like, I've done it. It's it's done now. Other people can see it, so therefore, like the global save is well is there. Not only that, but if you're in the file with somebody else, then who's saving it, right? If you if you click Command S, then it's like exactly. why. So so let me ask you Ilya, about kind of like a lot of these tools. Which tool, first of all, do you primarily use? Do you use Figma or you a uh, Rhino with Photoshop? So it's been Figma for so many years now. Uh, I did use Sketch as well very heavily actually in the past as well and during my time at sketch too but now it's mostly figma uh in regards to what software uses those uh outdated so to say uh floppy disk icons uh i feel like the, the only one that comes to my mind right now is microsoft word or something mm -hmm. i think they still do have like a little floppy disk icon up there uh, I don't use it a lot, like very rarely, maybe like twice a year or something, but uh, yeah. Hey, it's more than once. 
<laughs> it's two more times than I usually do too. So, <laughs> well, you're Logan. You you also don't own any Adobe products, which no, is not right which now. is new to me. I mean, unless you want to count Figma, like I mean, yeah, like, that's okay, it. Okay, that's fair. Then, well, they haven't fully merged yet, from what I understand. No. Um, and I don't think that that merger is going to go through, to be honest. But. You think they'll hit them with the monopoly clause in well, like two to three years? They and we'll all forget about so, it. So the government called my old manager and asked him point blank, "Are they a monopoly? Like, what do you guys use other than this?" And he was like, "There's no other tool that does this really well, um, and this is like the only tool that really works in its way and has all of its features in it already. Um, you know, Sketch is the closest one to it, maybe Adobe XD." But really, it's a monopoly because there's no other competitor even close to Figma now um, and just works as fast as it does, right? Um, so he's like, yeah, they're, they're the only tool we can use. Like, it's a monopoly. So that's kind of my understanding of the situation, but could be wrong. Um, so, Ilya, you used to work at Sketch, though? Yes, that's correct. What was the hardest challenge while working at Sketch. Okay, so at Sketch, I was responsible for, you know, marketing related stuff. So mostly like graphics that go into Twitter or Instagram and stuff like that. A lot of blog posts, images, very different from what I usually do. I consider myself to be more of a user interface designer, but like at Sketch, I was mostly responsible for, you know, graphics for, for blog posts, essentially. <laughs> um, but I think the most challenging project was creating all the assets for our holiday um, campaign at Sketch. So that was back in 2021, so the, the new year of 2022, sorry. Um, or no, was it like 2022? Anyway. Uh, yeah, so I've had to create like a lot of different graphics, a lot of carousels for Instagram and Twitter and lots of video work as well, just so that we had like a, we could have like a beautiful Christmas campaign. And I've had a, a, like a month or a month and a half to do that. And like, that was, that was not enough time, but like, <laughs> I, I somehow managed to do this, but like, it was a huge time constraint because like we had to do so many things and we got it. We had to start early, but it wasn't it wasn't enough time for me. Yeah, there's never never enough time as a designer. But you touched on something that I think Logan was like, "Ooh, uh, you did marketing design, but you consider yourself a product designer." And I think that that aligns more with what I do. I'm more product, but I also have to do marketing. Logan kind of comes from more of a marketing and has to do product. And we had a previous episode recently where we discussed like what was more difficult. Which one do you think is more difficult for you to do, marketing or product? I think product is quite a bit more challenging if if you look deep into it. Like there are so many aspects of product design that uh, where you have to get involved to sort of get it at the right level. And I, th I feel like at marketing design you don't have this level of you know this. Um, deep um you don't have to have this deep understanding of like uh, certain principles and stuff like that and processes to be able to excel at this so in my personal opinion product design is quite a bit more difficult and challenging i the only reason i argue the opposite is because oftentimes i find it more difficult to be creative in marketing, it's coming up with something more unique and not just so like, like looks like linear. But yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it is what it is now. But <laughs> we'll see if our website is like linear or not. I don't know by the time this goes out. But um, I find it just more difficult to come up with something that's so unique to that moment that's going to be gone in you know a year. But product, I understand like like the back of my hand, like how a user thinks and like what a user needs. And then if I don't know and I can't predict it, then I just respond to their behavior, interactions, and their needs. So for me, I find product to be way more intuitive than marketing, but I also don't have as much experience. Were you primarily 
a UI or a product designer or were you a marketing designer first? I would actually say that I am more of a more of a visual slash user interface designer, more so than the UX uh, slash research type of person. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm probably not that good at like the product side of things, like the actual like going from zero to a hundred, uh, creating a product and all the flows and stuff like that. But um, I'm more of a person who refines all the details and and makes the you know UI more magic, like uh, uh, cr create the magic by like polishing the all the details and introducing some Easter eggs, even uh, things that most companies don't implement because they have to be resource resourceful and like have uh, things work, like the prim primary things work, but like they don't have time and resources for that. I insist on like implementing stuff like that because that creates this. A little connection with the user and a surprise moment, which uh, I, th I feel like many products and companies do lack. And that's quite unfortunate. Because they're all engineering first. <laughs> yeah. That's like, why. And I, I get that. Like, you have a certain budget and you have a certain time frame that you have to sort of align into and uh, create a product within that time frame. An MVP, essentially, or or a polished MVP, but like like creating some stuff like linear does is usually not on everyone's radar, and that's also something that sets them apart from from everyone else. That's why people love linear so much and try to copy it. So, how do we convince these other companies from your from your perspective to then care about polish? Uh, convincing, convincing. Persuasion. So why? Like, why, why do? Uh, yeah, why how, do we need con to convince those companies? <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. You're because the 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 running kind of like I guess mainstream perspective is like this stuff is not primary. It's not going to. It's it's not like you said before. The th like the thing that needs to get done. The like functional stuff. So those resources are given away. Why aren't they equally invested in the polish and stuff? Like, um, how do how do, you, how do you like? go over that? How do you get past that? Usually, like, again, products have a certain purpose. And if a user can can utilize the product and use it uh, successfully, usually that's already a good thing. That that's pretty much enough for, the, for most companies. If the product works, that's great. But like certain companies, um, Apple, for example, like, a great example that I like to, to use is a dynamic island that they introduced. They didn't have to do it. Uh, they could have just, you know, use the, the, the good old notch for housing the cameras on their iPhones, but like they went far and beyond to create this interaction system, like the, the whole new, uh, thing that people can interact with. They, they didn't have to do that. And people usually say like, it's. It's not important, but like they actually enjoy using it because of, of all those animations and like those little things that they like you can do because of it. So um, I feel like th there are certain things that introduce this sort of a magical feeling, um, something you didn't expect. And like, I feel like that creates a better and stronger connection with the user personally. And uh, I don't know. I don't know how, why we should convince companies to to try and do that. Sure. To me, it's like very self-explanatory. Like people enjoy beautiful stuff. People love it. And if your product can do that, if, it, if you can reach this level of quality, people will only like speak even better of you and, and will recommend your product to other people, which is like the best thing you can do yeah we that's that's sort of how i like anytime i'm looking for work be it like freelance or like a new job any project whatever it is that's like that's that's sort of what i like hang my hat on there is like if they do care about design or not at the get-go um because you're right we, we don't need to be convincing these companies i think the more like 
whoever it was that said like not everybody deserves good design uh that's i 100 percent agree with that because the the more there is like the less good it really is at the end of the day if everybody i mean that's why i like like the the linear example that everybody sees right now. Now that it's like so easy to copy an example like linear and just have a site that looks like linear, uh, you know, it, it's so boring so quickly. And like that's the the ease of use behind like good, I guess if you want to call it like good design right now. But it's like, a, yeah, the less there is, I feel like the better it is when you actually see it and find those opportunities wherever it is through like work, projects, side products, whatever it is that's um that that's cool that feels like finding like a gem yeah definitely uh logan do you you're obviously on the uh the same side uh as Ilya about like trying to convince companies like it's the expe- it should be an expectation have you gone through an experience where you had to convince teammates that like this polish was required me? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think my best example of this was at DigitalOcean two years ago. Uh, I mean, they, you know, it, it went from like the DigitalOcean I grew up with, all the way. It was like, I mean, they had, they were one of the few tech companies with an entire illustration team. And that was badass to watch. Uh, it was inspiring. And like they, they had just so many assets available that like even after that team was gone, they had just years of room to roam with that library um and it was cool i like i loved that that's why i joined the ocean because they had such a visual presence and at the time i joined was like right before ipo uh so i mean it was like the twilio send grid takeover of digital ocean everybody on the finance team and marketing team from twilio uh migrated over to digital ocean at the same time and they were ready to lose all of it uh, the agency we worked with absolutely sucked uh we, we warned them against some what they were delivering on it, ultimately the project ended up back in our internal team's hands and we had to go like all the way up the ladder to our cmo to basically pitch that um while we didn't disagree that digital ocean needed to become a more mature presence being a mature presence didn't necessarily mean putting a suit and tie on every day we could be mature just by understanding who we were and who we came from where we came from <laughs> and i i'd say that was probably the hardest sell I, it wasn't directly a hey you don't think design matters it, and never has here and you've done just fine let me sell it to you it was definitely a hey this used to be like a pinnacle of good design and cloud computing and you you know kind of walked in and don't care about it and like let me reassure you that it does so i wouldn't say it's like a direct one-to-one example but that's that's probably as close as I can get in in recent time on like a, a large scale. Right. Yeah. That, that's what I figured. You had that kind of experience. What else at IBM? Um, we had to cr- recreate the platform for how customers create artificial intelligence. So I was in charge of that. Uh, with another colleague of mine, Stevie Johnson. And unfortunately, because it was such an enormous project, the project didn't consist of like, how do you get like the motion of like this thing flying out? What's the speed of this panel moving? I mean, it did a little bit, but they were already predetermined from uh, fortunately the design system. There was a lot of like just overall UX flows and then overall static mockups that like we don't really get to play with how the prototype feels it was very much like can you deliver this thing in this period of time and oftentimes those polish those details they get thrown to the to the wayside or whatever the saying is because they don't actually change the experience in that context those users didn't care if the modal had a move forward and then up versus just appearing you know, because their expectations, I guess, were already so low. <laughs> if we just got them the thing that they wanted, they'd already be 100 times happier than they were yesterday. You know what I mean? So oftentimes, uh, like I said before, you know, the, the priorities of the company, shifting the resources around does impact that. But also time constraints, um, also 
try, competing with other competitors, right? If you open yourself up to, uh, like, the opportunity for someone to slice your throat. Now, that sounds very brutal. But something that we had internally was, why would we give the opportunity for other companies or other competitors to beat us at design if we should be the best at design? And we know what to do. We had the best designers around us. We could do it. It's just about convincing everyone else around us. So uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to like all the nitty gritty details, but we got, I'd say like 80% of the way there. And I think that definitely insanely helped the experience overall. But just as a general point, design itself is something that more companies should be investing in. But getting the details right is something that's very difficult to push people towards. But when it succeeds, it really is noticed by customers. And that is uh, an, like like an opportunity for a, a competitor to come around and say, hey, gotcha. Like, we figured this little thing out. You couldn't figure out. We got three of your customers because we just did this one little tiny thing right, and it made their life feel better. It didn't change their life, but it made them feel more appreciated. Like, we have a higher expectation for our users as much as ourselves. So moving on from polish and all that kind of stuff, uh, are there any challenges that you're, you're wanting to face in design that you maybe haven't had the experience of designing for or designing with? Uh, is there something that you're like, oh, yeah, I would love if this happened and I got the opportunity to kind of tackle it? Um, so it's been kind of one of my dream projects to work on is like any kind of uh, like automotive user interface, so like an interface mm -hmm. for a car, um, because I feel like we're at a at a stage where more more and more car manufacturers are going to sort of transition into this better software um, era, uh, because like Tesla has shown everyone that great software can be achieved in a car, and like everybody is now catching up. And I feel like there's going to be a lot of demand for designers uh, who who pr preferably can specialize in that. So I would love to have a chance to sometime in the future, perhaps work on such a project. I hope you do. And I'll tell you why. When I was in college, uh, a friend of mine was driving us to a party and we both don't really drink. So she was like, yeah, I could drive and whatever, whatever. So we get in the car and I wanted to go change the music because she listened to country at the time. I didn't listen to country. I, I, I live in Texas now, so now I'm like all about country, whatever. But gross. I know, gross. It, it it changes you. It, it does when you live in when you live in the South. It really does make you appreciate it more. But anyways, she was really into country, and I didn't like it at the time. So I went to go change the radio, but I couldn't figure it out. And I'll tell you why. Do you ever been to like a like a arcade? And there's like those games where there's like a big ball on the machine. You got to roll the ball to move the cursor or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was the control in the car. Really? Which car was it? I have no idea. It was such an old car. And it had a screen that was a freaking PC screen. It was a Windows screen. It was running Windows. And it had a rolling mouse cursor thing. And you had to roll it over and then hit it to get the icon on the screen to, to you know be tapped. It was the most backwards interface I've ever seen. Worst experience in a car. I have no idea how she didn't crash the car yet, God forbid. Mm -hmm. But definitely something that that is very interesting to me is, is car UI. So what about the car UI, those little HUDs or whatever they're called, what are you interested about like designing for them? Like why that? So the primary reason why I feel like software is so important in a car these days because it's adaptive. Like, again, like with smartphones, we used to have like keyboards embedded in plastic and you couldn't like really have any specific keys for this scenario and stuff like that. But like once smartphones came to fruition, suddenly you can and people like, like, like this and love this. So uh, why wouldn't you use a car that can adapt to you, to your style, and to what you like to do most often. So, like, 
rearranging stuff on the screen depending on what you use and uh, things that you don't use you get get hidden away or like be put to the side where you use it less frequently i don't like all of all of the you know thousands of well not thousands but like tens of different controls and buttons and knobs i am a huge like skeuomorphism fan like i do like skeuomorphism and like the real objects and the um and the joy that you get when you're interacting with like real objects but i feel like cars are one thing where i feel like it's sort of archaic and needs to move on to something new and more adaptive why do you think everyone hates skeuomorphism um because it's been a trend for such a long time to to cut off all the unnecessary bits and pieces like all the unnecessary like textures and details of the real world because people are now very used to modern interfaces and i feel like that point in time came where where apple sort of introduced the ios 7 the infamous ios 7 that removed old skew morphism and i feel like that that was a very brave move by apple because that sort of meant we are like that we are entering a new era because they're the trendsetters and uh, that meant that people got so familiar with the user interface of the smartphone that we did not need any you know real world resembles of of the objects to be able to to navigate this user interface and and the and the whole experience was essentially identical so we, you didn't need to have those um mm -hmm. you know complex textures of of leather or like real paper in the in the notes app or stuff like that so that all went away i, I feel like people just people sort of compare it to the the days of the like 2000 to 2010 the era of you know windows vista and stuff like that they don't want to sort of have this association with the with the old they want to move on to something more cleaner and simpler that's why people wouldn't like to use geomorphism or like see geomorphic interfaces these days well i definitely see it coming back but the only thing I'd say is like, you know, beyond the texture, skeuomorphism helped the experience because you understood how to interact with something based on how it looked. So you knew to flip a page because it has the same animation as flipping a page, right? You're able yeah. to, you know, take a picture, it kind of looks like a button uh, and, and so forth. It kind of it didn't just look like the real world, it behaved like the real world. And that's why I so much loved it because it really taught people how to use the technology but in a familiar way and not really having them relearn it like the way it is now it's kind of hard to get to figure it out okay so what does this button do you know it's freaking dex laboratory all over again so it's kind of like yeah it sort of felt oh, like yeah. a necessary like a necessary step for people to like familiarize themselves with technology and get but now that they it. have you know we could have I think we could dial back a lot of the textures and kind of the heavy shadows and gradient and stuff. Sure, that's fine. But, you know, we never really got rid of skeuomorphism. It just kind of morphed into something a little bit less texture focus and visual focus and more uh, like behind the scenes, uh, like dragging and, you know, those kind of interactions. The gestures became way more popular with iOS 7 and, and further because um, you didn't have to render the the textures in the same way you could just render a square that's flat um okay so you do like skeuomorphic design uh where do you see then like the next five years going with all this uh currently flat 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 humans of flat design you know it's kind of like probably like us three you know Logan doesn't like skeuomorphism or any of that. No, I, dude, I go back and forth. It's like it depends how it's used. I like some of the new, the new, more, new morphic stuff that I've seen lately. That like, like you said, it's sort of a dialed back textures. Uh, it's sort of like a re uh, approach to skeuomorphism. I feel like, yeah, I just don't have the like the level of nostalgia that you do 
for it. I mean, like you jumped into interface design at a super early age and that I didn't do. And I also feel like that I'm going to tie this back to something um, that I'm going to, I'm going to jump us onto a different topic real quick and bring it right back. Uh, Cause I think I can answer your marketing versus product question and which one is harder and which one is easier. Uh, all based on how somebody got into yeah, design. Yeah. Elliot, how did you get into design? I just started, you know, I just wanted to have my own space on the internet when I was nine years old. And uh, I sort of taught my way in by learning coding first, so HTML, CSS. Then I had the need to create my own graphics to be able to like have more control over what I do on the internet. So learn Photoshop and in Photoshop, I suddenly realized that this is freaking awesome. I just love the process of like creating graphics. I just love something appearing on my screen and like looking exactly like this like on the web and people actually interacting with this. So I, I just had the joy of creating stuff that people use. So that sort of evolved over time into being a, a more serious hobby and then a, a job as well. What was sort of like your initial, like, what, what were you looking to for inspiration back then? Everything. Like every other website, application, like even the real world, I don't know, graphic design in the real world, like, I don't know, posters and stuff like that. So brand work, print work, anything that looked great sort of inspired me. And you sort of start comparing the ugly versus beautiful. And you sort of, you're teaching yourself on why certain things are not as good and why the good things are working. So that sort of naturally comes as you, as you go into it. Awesome. I have a very similar background there. I, uh, I'd say mine's slightly more, um, like traditional arts, uh, the Mitch, how about you? How did you get into this? I had a friend who had a Joe broken iPhone and it was really cool. And yep, I was like, what is, okay. what, how do you design these? How do you get these like really cool icons on your phone and replace the ones that are already there? And I went into the world of the Joe breaking community, which I think was one of the best communities on the internet at the time. Uh, still think it was, was one of the best. It's no longer really a thing. Cause you know, you don't really need to do that anymore. Cause you can kind of do everything you, Joe Brayton can today, uh, but it was a really amazing magical time, and I got into like hacking my iPhone, and I was like, okay, well, I don't know how to code, but I can definitely try to replicate what these like icon themes, kind of like iPhone themes, were. And so I started drawing and recreating the icons that I saw. Like Max Rudberg is a great designer today, but also one of the OGs of like that movement trying to create you know skins for the iPhone and so many others and I just found my way into Photoshop because that, that was a tool that all these people were using they go oh you can create this in Photoshop and I'm like what and then there's a website called 365 PSD by uh, Jonah Rico and it allowed you to download the PSD in expect so those who don't know PSD stands for uh, Photoshop format basically it's for Photoshop so uh, you can download it, you can inspect it, and then you can use it for whatever you want it. So I was like, oh my gosh, no way. And so every day he would post a new one and I would download it and I would just practice recreating it and understanding his style, understanding how he built this with a vector. And I thought it was the coolest thing. And then basically I just kind of pursued them like, oh, I want to make apps, but I don't want to have to do coding. And I just kind of pursued the design side. So that's how I got into it. There you go, Mitch. Yeah. You wanted awesome. to make product stuff early. Ilya and I wanted to make cool shit for the web. Yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> I wanted to make websites too, but I didn't know how to make them, so I just gave up on that. That's too awesome. young. I miss the the old underground days. But if I was to go day. back in time, I would have taught myself web design when it was early, and you could you don't need all these frameworks to code a website. I really wish I learned it back then. I understand the basics. I understand why things are the way they are now. Um, I think it's much harder to get in now because there's so much to worry about. You got to have all these other frameworks and stuff. And then it's like, all right, but then that's a whole different skill besides the visual, you know, uh, curation of understanding what's good and what's bad. 
And then also on top of that, the user experience, like what's the arrangement of these objects in the certain pattern that actually makes sense mentally without having to teach somebody how to use it? Also a completely different skill. And then, you know, then it's like the marketing and illustrations, all these different things kind of added up. And I wish I actually spent a little more time focusing on some of those things than I did in other areas. Uh, but I think that it worked out pretty well. Totally. <laughs> I feel like, dude, when you said, yeah, it's like, it's hard as hell to get into coding right now. I tell everybody, like, anybody who asks me, I'm like, good luck. Well, like, I, I spent half my day rewriting config files today. And like, now, I mean, like, Bun came out a few days ago. Bun is this new... Uh, runtime that essentially like the reason for its existence is because everything to do with JavaScript right now is way too damn hard. And like, it, it's not coming out as a like, ah, here's another one. Like Bun is actually taking a very simplistic approach to it compared to what Node has done over the past few years. And it's like, I feel like that should be more eye opening to a lot of the people who are working with JavaScript on a day to day basis, especially like there's been a lot of wars on like, engineering twitter in the past Wars. week between dude if you think design twitter is bad i've seen engineering twitter get really bad in the past couple of days like basically typescript uh typescript's like it, it's type safety on top of javascript and it makes code easier to write for larger code bases because you'll be able you have better syntax um, and being able to see like what is being written or how things should be written based on types uh, and some of the other built-in features that typescript comes with However, um, DHH, the guy who founded Basecamp, hey, all those, he's very against it. Uh, and he's like, you know, he, he grew up on, I mean, he wrote Ruby on Rails and like PHP and like everything from the early 2000s, which like very few uh, pieces of technology from then on use type safety. Uh, so like his crowd is very like, oh, like, what do you need type safety for? Like, and maybe just be a better developer. <laughs> and like, it is... I, I've seen people jump into other, like, into repos that are, like, PHP repos and just take in their, like, 100,000 followers to just, like, spam somebody's repo in the past few days. I'm like, this is, this is wild. But, yeah, no, I, I don't advise anybody to get into coding right now. It's way too damn hard to just make a website. Just use Framer. Just use That's Framer. That's our sponsor. That's just use right Framer. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great tool. Uh, I would say probably you spend half my time in Framer, half my time in Figma at this point. Uh, okay, so I know we're almost up on time, and I want to ask you one last question, which is a question we ask all of our guests, if you've listened to the uh, podcast before, uh, and those who are listening are very familiar with this. This whole episode, all every episode we do, is trying to understand how the person we're interviewing, our guest, shapes the world of design. How has the world of design shaped you? Um, so I think that design in itself really helped me to become better and more confident. That's the and that, that's like the main thing that happened to me. I was and I'm still very shy as a person. Like I'm, I'm not used to like even being interviewed. Like I'm and at interviews, I'm I'm just you know I'm I'm shaking and I'm like not preferred I'm, I'm nervous and stuff but like it used to be so bad in the past but like being a designer really helped me to step that up and be better now uh, and of course connections i've never met so many great awesome people uh anywhere else than in the design uh, design community so so many great folks are um very supportive and they are just you know they're the ch they're changing the industry by just introducing the stuff that they do so i i just enjoy being a part of that uh that community in that circle so yeah definitely the community aspect and the confidence for sure that's awesome that's a great answer thank you thank you for coming Absolutely. on the pod thank you for having me hopefully we didn't scare you <laughs> i will never get used to this but Thank you. For, thank you for having <laughs> me. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And if you haven't subscribed, please go to Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast to get the latest updates of when we drop new episodes and give us a five-star rating or a thumbs up wherever you're listening 
it greatly appreciate it greatly helps us and we appreciate it so much so thank you